Uh, well, uh, this is going to be our last video of 2020. Um, you'll probably be watching it at the very beginning of 2021. Um, today is the 30th of December, uh, and it's, uh, it's certainly been a, a strange year. Um, one of the big uh, pluses, really, is that this first lockdown gave us a little bit of time to think about how we might go about achieving regular YouTube videos, which is something we've been asked to do a lot and something we'd like to do, and we could never really see a way of doing it. But um, we came up with this sort of quick walk round uncut format, which has worked really well. Um, Jamie films everything that's going on uh, during the week and then just grabs one of us to do a, a quick 20 minute walk round, or <laughs> although it seems to creep to 20, 30, 40, 50 minutes. Um, <laughs> And so it's quite an efficient way of doing it. So that's, that's been a real, a real plus, really, of uh, 2020, is uh, being able to do these videos. Um, and, and the sort of response that we've had has been amazing. We never really thought they would be received that well. It's just quite a lot of people asked us to do them. So uh, you know, thank you very much for uh, all your support. Um, on that note, we did a question and answer session last week. Uh, there were loads more questions. So Jamie's going to fire away with a few more. Yeah, that's to round two. Yeah. Um, Will Bayram, uh, it's for both of you. What did you both do before opening RetroPower, and was there an early build that helped get the RetroPower brand off the ground as it were? Are you yeah. going to start or yeah. yeah, I mean, um, I suppose the first part of that is how we started here at RetroPower, and that's one that I think a lot of people find quite interesting because we just started as a as very small. We um, always loved messing around with cars in our spare time. I, and that's the older brother. I was, <laughs> maybe you can tell. I was about to say, as you can probably tell, that's terrible. But uh, I guess I, I kind of got that from him. And actually, our dad was quite into cars, not to the same level we are, but there was definitely part of that rubbed off on us as well. So we were, we were messing around with cars in our spare time. And um, one day, just decided, it, wouldn't it be cool if we could make this into a living of some sort? Um, and we took on a small unit, which is actually just this, the one we're in now, um, which is now our metal workshop. Um, and we were literally just tinkering around with knackered old cars, to put it, to put it basic, how, how, it, how it is basically. Um, you know, and it, it just it just sort of really picked up steam. We we just started doing kind of basic repairs on old cars. Uh, we bought a couple of older cars, I think a Mini and something else, um, and kind of tarted them up. I mean, looking back now, I'd be sort of embarrassed to show the work we did. But then I'm also proud of the fact that we started from that and, and just worked our way up um, to what uh, what is a sort of position I think we're jointly very mm, proud yeah, of. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's actually a reasonable size enterprise. <laughs> yeah. Now. yeah. yeah. Um, He's still fixing the road and I can see. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 Jamie's, it's probably just out of shot, but Jamie's sitting in front of one of my cars, a Subaru Forester, which is giving me some, uh, some trouble at the moment. Um, but yeah, I mean, our own backgrounds, Nat was much more engineering mm. background. Yeah, I, I, um, I kind of, I, I grew up in a tiny village where there were more farms, well, obviously we both grew up, but grew up in a, a tiny village where there were more farms than houses, really, or at least as many farms as houses. And I kind of, from when I could see out of the window, the things I saw out of the window when I was sort of too little to really remember being outside were tractors outside on the farm. So I grew up loving farm machinery, and uh, I remember sort of sitting in a tractor when I was six and, you know, and going on and then starting working all my school holidays from, from when I was 12 on a farm. And you learn a lot on a farm very quickly about mending stuff and driving machines and things like that. And then, of course, we had a Land Rover and then a Peugeot pickup. And I remember sliding a Peugeot pickup around stubble fields when I was probably in my sort of early to mid-teens, I think probably 13-ish, sort of sliding a Peugeot pickup around a stubble field and things like that. So I kind of got into cars a little bit then. But it was more machinery than cars, just messing about with bits of machinery, mending tractors, driving tractors, just driving big things that were good fun. And that kind of got me into engineering, as well as at school I was in to engineering of some sort. It was originally chemical engineering, abandoned that idea on advice of my teacher, and I think he was right at the time, uh, and went down the mechanical engineering route. Linked to agriculture, I actually did a degree in, um, in mechanical engineering agri with agricultural bias, agricultural engineering. Um, 
came out of that, and I was probably going to go into farm machinery, but, but, the, the long background, but anyway, I was going to go into farm machinery. The last minute I didn't, uh, I, I went to a steel mill, and I actually started working in a steel mill, kind of progressed through the ranks there a little bit, and ended up sort of in planning production, and then in improving, mending bits of equipment in the mill, learning about equipment in the mill, and then process improvement there. I moved on to another company that made um, automotive sealing systems, uh, and it went there was process improvement there, but progressed on to, as you t tend to find in life, sort of just by default of circumstance, ended up being um, in, on a team of engineers actually just building production lines and building all the equipment in the place. And that kind of got me into the, back, the nuts and bolts of built, not being scared by building machines that you don't know an awful lot about. And that really is one of the sort of key catalysts to the, the, the business as it is now, is this sort of not, no fear of bits of engineering, really. Um, anyway, I've been there a few years. 2008 hit, the economic slump, it hit production where I was working. And we, 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 our hours were briefly reduced for a while there, and it gave me time to sort of think about what I was doing. And that aligns with the point that Carol was talking about earlier of where we were wondering about maybe we ought to do something between us tinkering about with cars and that that was sort of how, my background and how it fed into into being here and i'll yeah hand to about you with to, cars. yeah yeah. <laughs> yeah my my background from school i, I was definitely drawn towards auto, automotive stuff and and the engineering side of things but i think my biggest problem was i i had no no enjoyment to the theoretical side of it at all. So although I, although I did go to university to do computer aid and engineering, I, I basically left almost straight away because I just I had no interest in doing the straight you know, maths or whatever it was, the theoretical side of it. I just was interested in the hands-on side of it. Um, so I, I left uni to just and just messed around with cars in my spare time. Uh, I had a job in a hotel um, as a bar manager. Um, and that gave me quite a lot of time to concentrate on the other thing that I continue to be really passionate about now, which is music. And I did a lot of music production, um, which I really enjoyed doing. And I, to be honest, I still would probably do more of, given, the, given a bit more time, but children take over your life and uh, I don't have as much spare time as I used to. Um, but yeah, and it was, for me, it was just the doing it in my spare time. Um, and then, yeah, it just, it just kind of, came about that I started buying and selling cars and doing work on sort of friends' cars. And actually that was m making me enough money that I, I could leave my job at the hotel, which I did. Um, it was not a very reliable income. It was very much, uh, you know, spikes and troughs. Um, but there was no better time at that point. Um, neither of us had any children. Uh, you know, Nat was unsure of uh, the future, uh, his company. I was basically working for myself anyway, and we thought, hey, let's get a workshop and start kind of mm. more, more properly <laughs> working on cars. But it was, it was only very, there was no massive game plan. Um, we just loved working on cars. I mean, that's the thing, that, the, the thread that goes throughout is we just love working on cars. There was never mm. a huge plan to take over the world with, you know, these crazy resto mod builds, but we've always liked modifying cars and almost uh, kind of in parallel with our sort of passion and, and growth of the business doing modified cars, there's been a massive resurgence of interest in modified classic cars, and it's just, just almost run in parallel with the mm. sort of growth of our business. Yeah, it seems um, to. I think you tend to find, if you plan, in my opinion, now I'm sure there are, there are, there are amazing business leaders around the world that will have planned their entire um, lifespan of their business from start to finish, but certainly in my opinion, planning too far ahead tends not to work too well. You tend to have to work on the basis that things will align themselves at various points. You have to work bloody hard um, and you have to have a, a vision for each stage of the process, but trying to see all the way through mm. from one end to the other from the beginning tends not to work because you'll get knocked offline. And what, what you tend to have to do is let things align. And they, as Carl's just said, they, they, they did in that we, our, our ideas of re-engineering cars to improve them have just lined up with there being a market for people interested in re-engineered cars. Now, some of that was a bit of a vision that surely other people must be interested in this if we are, but equally, it, there's also good fortune to it. Yeah, yeah I think you was, was part of the question, uh, was there a particular project that really uh, sort of drove things forward? Yeah, and yeah. yes, there was. I mean, in, <coughs> in the very early days, we, 
things ramped up quite quickly in the first year or so. We went from uh, just sort of tinkering around, welding up sills and arches. Uh, we did a couple of slightly bigger projects on, uh, I think one was a Vauxhall Chevette. We did an engine conversion on it, did some paint work on it, did some interior work on it. Um, and then I think that and another Opal uh, being seen at some of the Vauxhall Opal shows led to our first complete bare, bare metal shell to finish turnkey car project, which was an Opal Ascona 400 replica. Um, so a replica of the sort of iconic group, was it Group B or Group 4? Yeah, Group, group B, group B uh, yeah. wide arched Opal sort of saloon, amazing looking car, still with them today. Um, and yeah, we did that, I think we finished that in 2011. Um, and then the owner of that car just took it to a huge number of shows and it got I've seen in magazine shows all over the place, and that generated quite a quite a big spike in um, the number of projects we were getting approached about. Um, and it, it was from that point that it started to become a lot more complete start to finish builds rather than bitting and bobbing. Uh, we still did quite a few body shell restorations, um, and then it, it's just kind of grown and grown. And then we took on, I think it was the same year, 2011, we took on uh, a second workshop because the building we're in, thankfully, has uh, had other companies in it which have subsequently moved out. Um, so we took on the body shop, uh, and then in 2013, I think it was, we took on what is now our build workshop. Um, and then I, th I would say in the last probably four years, things have really just gone exponential. Mm. Um, I mean, helped uh, along the way, particularly more recently by the YouTube videos. Uh, obviously, Gordon approaching us to build a car was just amazing. Uh, you know, you sort of wonder how you're going to top something like that. But of course, that has led to, you know, an increase in the number of inquiries. And we've got to this amazing position really now where we are only doing complete, you know, ground up turnkey car builds. Um, it sounds a bit big-headed to say we're picking and choosing, but it's, it, it's certainly we've got to the point now where we're only taking on a very small number of the total inquiries we get. And they're the ones where we feel kind of a, a shared interest for the project. Mm. We get why it's being done. We're enthused about it. We get on well with the owner. Um, you've got, I mean, it's quite a journey you have with the customer, so you've really mm. got to have a good relationship with them. So you've got to get a good feel for that to start with. Uh, and, and absolutely share this vision. And it's, it's amazing, it can be so many different things. We've got, there's no one thing we particularly no, no, like. No. Yeah. So, so it, and you couldn't, it would be very difficult even to pick a, a common thread. Mm, there's could, just something that car people see to, and, and you get people coming around and they'll put forward an idea and you just know straight away, it's either, hmm, yeah, I'm not sure about that, or straight away, it's just like, yeah, that's, yeah. that's an awesome idea. Yeah, I really want to build this car for you. So it's an interesting comparison. I think we've, you've made it before and it's been made before. Um, talking about the sort of journey with the customer is comparing it to something like Grand Designs. If you, mm. Obviously, a lot of people will have seen that. Um, Kevin McLeod and Grand Designs on TV, and the, the idea is it, it's not dissimilar because there's a, in most cases, I mean, there's a few really well planned, really well executed ones that everything goes smoothly and all the boxes get ticked, and it's great. But more often than not, people are borrowing, <laughs> scraping pennies from down the sides of the sofa, um, selling off their grandmother and everything else to try and to try and to try and fund a build that then takes three times as long as it should have done. Um, but the end result is usually in those cases something awesome that they're incredibly proud of and although they've lost a lot of hair along the way and, and generally been very stressed and are now financially broken uh, at the end of it they've got something that's absolutely incredible and the journey's not dissimilar and we're hopefully not financially broken but they but the the journey's quite similar in that it is pretty stressful for those cons it can be stressful for us it certainly it can be stressful for the customer trying mm. to make decisions um, and it is a and it is a big journey it's not a simple thing uh, you, you know, it's not a it's not a thing to be taken lightly. It's a big project, um, and, and but and to get it right is it, it, a lot of work. But the satisfaction having got it right at the end is, is amazing for us and I believe because certainly our, the feedback we get is likewise for our customers is that the end result is really something special. Um, but but that is a re is a result of an enormous amount of work and an enormous amount of thought and an enormous amount of tearing hair out. <laughs> I think that goes for the early, the early stages of the business as well. As, 
just a huge amount of hard work. You know, mm, it started yeah, with yeah. just me and Nats, and uh, we, we we earned virtually virtually yeah. nothing really. Mm. It's just about enough to pay some well rent or mortgage for for the first. I don't know. Yeah. Well, it's, it's only really in the last three or four years yeah. that we've been able to take a salary that I would say is, re is reasonable. But uh, yeah, certainly in the early days, you wouldn't have wanted to look at our <laughs> hourly rate. I bet we were working for about 10p an hour for the first year, I imagine. Yeah. We've, never, we've never lost money. Um, but, but equally, yeah, in the first, in the first sort of, in the first couple, two or three years, you know, we barely, we barely made any. But it wasn't really that. It's that we, any money we made was just being spent mm. on, on, on equipment yeah. and, and expansion yeah. and growing the business. We've, we've, we've never, we've never taken a lot of money home. But, but equally, we've never borrowed any either. Mm. That's one of the uh, one of the things that there. Surprises really. people as well, I think. Yeah, yeah, so much, so much around us. You think a lot of companies sort of go in there with a grand plan and you know borrow hundreds of thousands of pounds, set everything up, and then hope the work comes in. And that's just never been no, no, our no, way. We just <laughs> put the money we make back into buying equipment and, and I tacked know. a little bit on my mortgage when we first set up just to get us going. But it was only in, ten grand. Then. It, was, it was ten thousand quid. <laughs> that, 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 that's, that's gone now. But, but, but the other side of that is realistic. Although it got the ball rolling, very little of that is actually spent on anything that's still sat around us now. Maybe some shelves and things, I think. Um, but there's not much of that that's still sat around us now. Realistically, we needed some to, to buy some initial cars to actually restore, to sell on, yeah. or restore in inverted commas, but to restore, to sell on, to get the ball rolling because mm. you've got to do some work to become to known. Show, and to show your work. That yeah, was so. My next question Was there a point where you found yourself? looking actively looking for projects to take on in the early years because you knew you were gonna you had a gap to fill like physically or um i, th I think it was only at the very very start i think mm. where we were we we had this idea that you would be able to make money by buying cars restoring them and selling them on which uh, and here's, here's, this is a fairly important statement that a lot of people might be taken aback by, but it's pretty much impossible to, to buy and sell cars, buy cars that need a reasonable level of restoration and sell them on and make a profit without just bodging them up and doing the work badly. If you do the work to a good enough standard, um, it'll always cost more than, than the, the, the value you've added to the car, in a, except perhaps in a very few yeah. Like the very really, top end really of the market, exotic yeah, cars, yeah. That are hundreds of thousands, if not millions, anyway, where you could you can add another hundred thousand and no, to the price, and nobody really notices. But in, certainly, I would say in the up to a hundred thousand pound mm. car it just bracket, happen. it just doesn't happen. The only, the only the only way you can make money buying a car, doing it up, and selling it on it in that sub hundred grand bracket is by doing the work badly. Yeah, big statement. That. No, I'd agree. I'd agree. I'd, I completely agree. You know, I completely agree. We've 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 seen a lot of work. Um, yes. <laughs> a lot of work's come in through the doors. That's been through that sort of uh, yeah. trail of events, and and we and, and none of it's been acceptable to be left in the car to go back out of the door. So that, that says a lot. Go on then. Um, I guess one links rather nicely to what we've talked about already. Uh, Rick Honey asked, uh, Cal, have you ever done an electric conversion on a classic? Do you think <laughs> the idea will catch on? Or will people always prefer internal combustion conversions? Mm. Uh, it's an interesting, interesting question. It's one we get asked a lot. Um, you know, I've had, even had, I've had quite a lot of people approach us and say, you know, would you consider doing an electric build? And of course, people ask the question on social media quite a lot. And the, the basic answer is yes, we would definitely. I, I think it's only a matter of time before we do. But there's a hesitation about the, there's just this massive bandwagon at the moment of electrifying classic cars, obviously off the back of the fact that there's a huge increase in interest in mainstream electric cars. Um, and I don't necessarily agree that in most of these cases it's a good idea. Um, electric certainly has its place at the moment. Um, for an everyday car that you do your commuting in, uh, it does make a lot of sense. I mean, there's always, there's always the argument of, um, is it really that good for the environment because the electricity is being generated anyway, that's surely polluting the environment and, you know, all the changes of state of energy are probably actually less efficient um, than just putting the fuel directly into the car. But I, I, I kind of see the flip side to that, that you can generate that electricity in a lot of different ways. Mm. And so it's kind of quite future-proof in that 
as we have more um, you know, wind farms, solar farms, all the rest of it, uh, it does then become a lot better for the environment. It's just, and it's just, it's just quite future-proof because you can generate electricity in a lot of ways and store it and then use it in an electric car. Um, but for an enthusiast car, I mean, bear in mind most, most classic cars, despite people's best intentions of using them as daily cars, they realistically come out on reasonably nice days. They mm. go on a weekend trip here and there. They might go to Le Mans or Spa or you sub, know, five, what sub five thousand miles a year. Sub yeah. five thousand miles a year, yeah. and in a lot of cases, well sub five thousand miles a year. And, and to be honest, if you're doing less than five thousand miles a year, the fuel usage and the emissions you would have to be doing that for a long, long, long while to offset the environmental impact of producing the batteries that are in, yeah. in that car. Um, and to be honest, although the producers of electric cars will argue that these batteries will go on <laughs> forever, I, it's not really proven yet. All, um, all of the projections that, that I've read anyway and all of the comparisons that I've read are all based on a vehicle having a 10-year lifespan, mm. um, which conveniently aligns with the projected life on a battery on a mm. car that's not doing too many miles. Mm. Um, but that they're then comparing to writing off the life of an internal combustion engine car over 10 years as well. Yeah. Not that that's very relevant to classic, but the, uh, the, 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 other, the other thing really is the, uh, the, the sort of enjoyment factor. Mm. And for me, the joy of driving an old car comes from a lot of different things. Um, I have absolutely no argument that electric makes a lot of sense in terms of pure performance. Um, in fact, if you look at what mainstream diesel, diesel car production have been trying to aim at over the years, you know, they're, they're constantly trying to get the emissions better, the efficiency better, and the power better, and, you know, an internal combustion engine is most efficient at a particular rev, so they keep adding more and more gears to try and keep the car, the revs closer to that magical peak, you know, torque, most efficient band of the engine, and effectively, you're just adding more and more weight, different size turbos, mm. a small turbo, because the big one makes the power, the small one spills it up. Uh, more and more gears to keep it in the rev range and really what you're doing is adding loads of weight to and try and achieve something that's running at its peak efficiency mm. all the time which basically is an electric motor yeah. um, sticking plasters sticking yeah, plaster yeah. engineering so, so as for an everyday car as, a, as an alternative to a, a sort of trying to be really efficient turbo diesel electric makes huge sense but for a car that i want to take out on the weekend i wouldn't be taking out a modern turbo diesel i'd be taking out a, you know a, a petrol engine, you know, either like a screaming four cylinder or, you know, a V8, so, something where the process of driving it is rewarding, you know, you feel like you're revving it out and changing gears at the right moment and, and all of that experience and the noise and, and even the smell, it, it all kind of goes together to just sort of intoxicate the senses and it, it all goes together to me to be part of the experience. And although I think I would get some enjoyment from driving certain electric cars, I don't think I would ever have, let's say, an electric converted Ferrari and an internal combustion one next to each other in the garage and go wake up on a Sunday morning with the sun out and so I'm going to go for a trip out today and go, yeah, I'll take the electric one. I can't imagine I would ever do that. No. I guess it's also picking your battles in terms of the cars, because there are certain cars that seem better suited to yeah. electrification, cars that aren't, weren't sold you know, on the ground. Yeah, yeah. less engaging. Yeah, to exactly. Yeah, yeah. exactly. And we, 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 the, one of the, the sort of ones we've most had a serious discussion mm. with somebody about was doing a Citroen SM electric. And I, I really agree with that because it was always meant to be this kind of remote driving experience. You were isolated. It had this crazy mm. hydraulic steering system with zero yeah. caster. So the, st the, the hydraulic system actually self-centered the steering for you. Um, must be a very strange driving experience, but one that was specifically engineered to make you feel like you were just remote magic controlling carpet, a, a, yeah, a, a yeah. magic carpet. And I think that would completely suit that. And, and, and if you then combined in using it a lot, so mm. electric makes more sense, then that would make huge sense. So if somebody said, yeah, I want to make a, um, an electric Citroen SM, or let's say something maybe like a Range Rover, yeah. Um, that, I'm gonna, that I'm going to use yeah. all the time, or I'm going to use it in London city centre, mm. or I'm going to use it and do 50,000 miles a year in it, um, then it kind of would yeah. make a lot more sense in those instances. Yeah. But 
when I see you know people taking absolute classic drivers' cars, you know, Alpha 105s, Ferraris, that sort of thing, E-type. and uh, E-type, <laughs> E-type. Oh, geez, I don't even get me started, but yeah, E-type or Alpha 105, and doing an electric conversion and pitching it as somehow the future. It's not given these cars are blatantly going to do 5,000 miles a year or probably a lot less. It just doesn't it doesn't make sense to me at all. Um, so uh, yeah, we would consider doing electric. I think we will do one, but I think it needs a lot more thought than just bunging a motor than just in chucking it. a motor in any old classic <laughs> car and yeah. thinking it's great. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Oh, glad that's still running because that would have been yeah, <laughs> annoying yeah, yeah. if that hadn't come out yeah. well. Uh, David Abbott asks, Nat, what has been the most technically challenging build you guys have undertaken in your time? Uh, well, we've done a few fairly technically challenging ones, but I think as an overall package, uh, it would be Gordon Murray's Martin Escort. Um, that was it was challenging in a lot of ways, some of them self-inflicted. Um, <laughs> We obviously, it, Gordon's spec was actually reasonably basic for the car, but there were certain specific things that he wanted, which are not necessarily dead easy to achieve if you to do them properly. Um, the heating and ventilation system, as an example, in that car was he, he wanted a, a, a sort of reliable, modern, um, high output um, heating and ventilation system and to add that in, in the confines of a car that was never really designed to have such a thing, is actually quite challenging. There was quite a lot of work involved in that, so there was, there was one thing. Then fitting the, the engine and gearbox into the shell is a reasonably big job as well, because there's not a lot of room, so getting all that in. Um, but I guess the overall um, thing with that car is, that the, is who we were building it for. We, there, there, there could be no sort of, um, oh, you know, that'll do, or that's good enough sort of uh, areas in the car. It, 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 it's being built for somebody who will, <laughs> who's, who it's knows pressure, what's right and what's, yeah, so it's, just a, it's not that we would, we, would ne- we would ever really say that'll do, but no. you just have this uh, additional pressure nag- niggling at your mm. mind, you know, that could somebody, be somebody who has spent their yeah. entire life working on cars. It's going to scrutinise every detail. So although we we know we we already try and sort of work to the highest level we can, you just think, is it is it enough? Is it high enough? Yeah, yeah. We can't work for Ron yeah. Dennis. Yeah, yeah. yeah. You know, and you, you go, you look around his car collection. He's uh, he, he has the weights, and I, I dare say he'd be able to tell you straight off the bat that the weight in kilos of, of every car he owns, which is which is quite a. a, a a, a precise point uh, and that gives you an idea an insight into the sort of detail that he's going to be interested in in a car that's built for him so yeah there's a there's a fair challenge to that um, and i think that it it's it sharpened our nerves a little bit it sharpened our awareness of, of what we needed to to look at we we weren't doing a, a half job by any stretch anyway but it just made us think about what what somebody who was extremely demanding might want um, and trying to make sure that everything we engineered was as good as we could possibly make it. I'm sure we'll still look back on it in the future and think, well, we could have done that bit better. But at the point we did it, we were as happy as we could be about every piece of the car as we did it. And some of it was, you know, we, we, we pushed things much further than they needed to be just, just to make it look, well, just to make, not just look, just, just so that it was as thoroughly engineered as we could make it at the time. And things like the wiring loom on that car, where we, 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 you know, all of it has been done to a standard way in advance of what would need to be done on a car like that. It's on every connector that on, on the chassis is a Deutsch connector, where it, and apart from the actual final lamp connectors and things like that. Again, it's just where, well, they're better, we'll use those. And it's just every bit, every challenge in building that car was, was, a, was a matter of addressing a problem. What's the best solution that we're aware of or, or that we can think of? We'll use that as the solution. That was the way, all the way through that project, was just, just pushing ourselves and making sure that we did everything to the, to the nth degree as far as we could see. Yeah. I think that's probably a good, a good description, really, is that it was, it's probably the most technically challenging project we've done, not because building a Mark I Escort with a Cosworth Juratec in it and a Mazda six-speed box and even independent rear suspension mm. necessarily is that unbelievably complicated to do. Mm. It's just that we 
particularly with who the customer is in mind, we wanted to really push the level of execution in every area. So you know, every minute detail had you know, hours of procrastination involved. Um, so, you know, is this the best possible way we can do this detail? And I, I suppose that's why it became yeah, yeah. one of the most technically challenging builds that we've done. It's also quite different from most quick escorts that are built, that are yeah. often built with common <laughs> Yeah, detail. much more that raw, yeah. That requirement mm, job yeah. done, you know. Yeah, it's also a lot more refined with it being a sort of uh, uh, daily use car. You, you also have this thing at the back of, my, of your mind whilst building, you know, also aware of the cost that's involved. You think, well, what else could this person have had for, for the same money? And you, you start to think, well, it's got to be pretty good. <laughs> yeah. um, right. What were your two first cars and did you modify them? Certainly you did, because here we are. Yeah. Well, <laughs> I, don't know. I, well, I didn't actually. Awesome. Technically, my first car was a VW Polo Saloon, but it didn't last for very long. Was that Derby? Uh, yeah, yeah, that type of thing. Yeah, I can't remember exactly what it was. It wasn't a Derby, but yeah, a Mark classic. II. Yeah, Polo Classic it was. Mark II Polo Saloon, Polo Classic, which was rubbish. Um, <laughs> a terrible car. And uh, I rolled it end over end, and uh, it caught fire, and that was the end of that. Um, so, forgetting that one, I then decided to uh, buy a car I actually wanted, um, rather than one that was sort of, my parents had a bit of a say in and that was sort of sensible, um, and got a, uh, bought myself a, a work for the summer <laughs> to scrape some money together and bought myself a Manta GTE. Um, which which has has a has a <laughs> has a relevance to the business now because I learnt to weld very rapidly having bought that because <laughs> yeah. I needed to I could I could stick weld and that sort of stuff before that um, but I learnt to MIG weld very quickly because I realised that it was mainly made of rust with some filler. Um, <laughs> it's it was two years it was, old. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, pretty much. Yeah, it wasn't that old. It was well, it was ten years old and it was pretty much entirely made of rust. Um, you live and learn. Uh, it's given me a lifelong hatred for rust, uh, and yeah, and that was really. I didn't crash that one, so that was that was, that was yeah. good. Yeah, I soon learned that rear-wheel drive was better, um, less less crashy, uh, and yeah, I really enjoyed that car. It was good. I didn't particularly modify it. I messed around with it a bit, but I wouldn't say it was modified. I, but I used it as a the daily. Ne the, next, the next one was a step up, though. The, the second. Oh answer, yeah, because that bought was the, then a red. Yeah, red well, top yeah. conversion, which was. At the, Not time, common at the time, how yeah. old was the red top at the time? The, 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 the engine would have been, it was a 92 engine, and I did the conversion in 95, end of 95. Yeah, so it was a three-year-old yeah, three <laughs> Cavalier GSI yeah, 16 valve. Yeah, I was, when I was at university, I had the, had the GT, Manta GT when I was at university, and I went on placement, and I worked my summer holidays, so I got scraped enough money together to think about doing a proper man. So when I bought a, an exclusive, an 88 exclusive, uh, and I never drove it. My mum drove it back because her insurance cut saved me swapping the insurance around. My mum drove it back, and I immediately, as soon as I got it home, I got the Manitou from the farm, went down and pulled the engine and box out. <laughs> so I never actually drove it with the standard engine in it. And then uh, whenever I had a spare five minutes, I'd spent a bit of time on it and got the, got the engine stuck in, and uh, a bit later on put throttle bodies on it. And yeah, yeah, I used that for a, about a year as a road car, but it was almost permanently in bits because I was always doing something with it at uni. Uh, and then it got really ended by a truck so that was the end of that <laughs> um, and then I built my rear wheel drive 205 but that's all on the side it was what your uh... my, my first car was a Ford Sierra um, I can't remember the, oh it was an Azura, Azura it was one of, was yeah, one of the run out yeah. models where they kind of got, <laughs> took a base spec one and colour coded bumpers and put a colour coded spoiler on to kind of make it was look it a bit more modern no it was the white it was actually, to be honest, I thought it looked the absolute business. Yeah, it was a good top. car, actually. Um, and then it did. Or? It lasted. A, it had the Six miserable 1600. 1600 Pinto in it, which was then it did then get quite well modified. And sort of brought <laughs> on by the fact that the flywheel tried to remove itself from the engine. No, no, that was on um, the two liter. Was it? Yeah, that was on the oh, two liter. Yeah. Now you 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 just turned up was. one you turned up one day and said, Oh, I've just bought an engine later. from Phil and Mick Squires oh, right, at yeah. competition equipment. <laughs> okay. You turned up in the Sierra with the two litre in oh, the boot. Yeah, yeah, so yeah, I think <laughs> I must have just got fed I think I got fed I, I thought it was brought on by something else. No, it's not, not. Yeah. a hatch. I'm trying to picture how it was a hatch. hatch. It was a hatch. hatch. Azura hatch, white with the, you know, they had the five spokes, sort of slabby yeah. five spokes on these Azura ones on. Still got those. And there was another there was another one, there was an Azura and something else, and they were the light run out ones. Run out, yeah. Um and then, yeah, I put this uh, 
what was supposed to be a standard two-litre Pinto <laughs> from Phil and Mick Squires, as Nat just said. But actually, when I got it, after I got it in the boot, either Phil or Mick, I forget now, lifted the cam cover up, which was only lo loosely resting on, and said, oh, actually, that one's not standard. So oh, well, you've got it in there now. <laughs> <laughs> it's got uh, double valve springs. Yeah, it Piper 285 cam and double springs. And then I put a Weber 38 uh, degas car, yeah, was yeah. it, off the three-litre Capri. Well, I didn't have it jetted or anything, so it was still jetted for a three It's going fine. It's going fine. Put um, Jan Speed exhaust on it and lowered it on some cheapy sort of lowering springs and dampers. Probably bushed some of it, I think. I can't remember. Yeah, Probably yeah, just yeah. the front end, I think. And maybe an <coughs> upgraded Dampsy Roll. Laguna Splitter. Yeah, <laughs> Laguna Splitter, that would have been, uh, would have been good. But uh, yeah, actually, that, I'm, well, to be honest, I'm surprised I didn't kill myself in it. But uh, it, yeah, it was it actually pretty fast. Well. It, was, <laughs> it, was pretty, it was reasonably quick. Well, it seemed quick back then. So yeah, that was my first car, and yes, it did get modified. Super. Uh, right, final one for now. Uh, what are your favourite tools? Oh, that's a long list. <laughs> but, but yeah, the, the, the re really cool bits of equipment. I really like. I like the old Pell's nibbler, which is lurking there behind us, because because it costs next to nothing. And it's one of those things that you're only limited in terms of bashing bits of metal into shape. You're kind of only really limited by your imagination in what you can do with it. Um, it's one of those. It's one of those tools that sort of. It, it's really simple. It just sort of hammers stuff. It's just a reciprocating motion. Um, but it's absolutely amazing what you can do with it, and how many different, and how many new tasks you can find uh, that you can accomplish with it. And it's we we keep adapting it and adding to it and uh, doing that. And it, 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 it was amazing the number of little bits and bobs we've made with it uh, around the place. Um, my other old favourite tool, but I've got rid of it now. It's actually. Um, a friend of ours has, uh, has bought it. My old lathe, um, which is gone now. I had a, I had a Colchester. I bought a Colchester Master um, lathe, a 40 inch bed Colchester Master lathe, and I bought that in 1998 for 100 quid, delivered um, <laughs> from an ice cream man in Leicester who raced. Um, what did he race? He raced a, uh, a Firebird. He raced a, yeah, he raced a Firebird. <laughs> Um, strangely, uh, and, and had ice cream vans. So and I, and I, I went round there, and he'd got this <laughs> lathe for making bits for his racing car in the uh, in his shed. And he said, "Oh, I don't need it anymore." And I said, "Well, yeah, I'll give you hundred quid for it." He got it in the in the local paper for hundred quid. And I said, "Yeah, I'll give you hundred quid for it, but can you drop it off?" And he was like, "Yeah, yeah, yeah." He brought it round in the car trailer, and I put it in my parents' shed with a manitou. Um, I sort of put it through the door with the manager and rolled it in on some bits of old roll cage tubing and stuff. And, uh, and I've had that, and that only left Retro Power this year. So how, how long is that? That's 22 years. Tw yeah, tw yeah, 20, yeah, 22 years. I've had that lathe for 22 years, and it's made a lot of bits of car. Old it was 100 spot. quid well spent, that one. <laughs> <laughs> that wasn't a, that's not a bad tool, that one, I have to say. The, the, the little MIG welder that we use here every, almost every day, I've had a long time. Again, I bought that in probably 2002, I should think. It's actually sitting just behind the camera. Um, but I've, bought, I've had that years, and that, that's done rolls and rolls and rolls of wire and just keeps on going. It's amazing, some of the sort of random bits of kit you like. I've got, we've always got a few hand tools we like as well, certain ratchets. I've got a couple of fake on ratchets I really like, and sort of random stuff like that, and certain spanners you grow an affinity to. But, but yeah, I think the bit, in terms of the big metalworking gear, some of that, 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 that's probably a few of the things. Obviously, at the minute, flavour of the month is the, uh, the new big shrinker that I've put the massive air cylinder on, um, which you've probably seen, if you've seen the, uh, the workshop walk round video we did, I, I dwelled on it a bit then. But yeah, it's made, currently being used quite a lot on uh, making some, Stu's using it for making some panels, so uh, you'll see it quite a bit on videos uh, I imminently, I think. But uh, yeah, that, that, that's, a, that's a nice bit of kit. I'm quite, quite pleased with that, with the, with the few modifications we've done. That's, that's a nice, nice bit of equipment. I think, I, th I think for me, the 3D printer is probably the, one mm. of the cool. I don't, I don't get to use the tools as much as I used to these days, but uh, I think the thing that's allowed us to push the boundaries of what we're doing in terms of making one-off components 
uh, is the 3D printer. Mm. Uh, it's been a low, a low, uh, in the early days, it was the subject of much swearing and trying to get it working <laughs> right because as it was our way, we went with the option of <laughs> buying a relatively cheap one and then <laughs> and then re-engineering it all that to work properly. Week I started, I said. Uh, yeah, <laughs> there was an incredulous amount of spools of filament out. flying everywhere. Oh yeah, I'm this, surprised the whole thing that. didn't get thrown out the door. But, but Just, actually, that, in one morning, to find it deposited nearly a whole roll of filament inside its casing, I made. It was just in a nest of filament. It was the steering rack mount for the gold clipper yes. that you were doing. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, and it was a pain. Yes, it was a pain. But actually, now it's now it's functioning. The the ability just to prototype stuff is is, is amazing, mm. and have the confidence to design parts and get them machined, whereas we perhaps wouldn't have done before. Um, yeah, so that's it's definitely a, a, a really useful thing in in our kind of constant pursuit of pushing forward and pushing the boundaries of what we can do. Right. So so sudden cut. You might have noticed there. <laughs> you can't call this one an uncut. No. <laughs> no. <laughs> Technological failure. Te technical failure. <laughs> Maxed out the memory card. Anyway, uh, it's probably a good time to end. So, um, you know, thank you very much for watching the videos. Uh, 2020, as I said at the beginning, has been a slightly uh, weird year, but in terms of looking forward, it's just so exciting. There's so many cool projects around us, so many cool projects booked in. I'm excited to see all of these cars progress through the course of this year. Can't wait to see Utah, you know, reach completion. Um, the Morris, which is just out of shot here, that, you know, I can't wait to see that transform. And then we're just about to Jensen. start the Jensen CV8, yeah. uh, which is going to be an incredible project. Um, and I'm not even going to name the projects we've got coming in, but uh, what did you call it? Just uh, one long queue of awesome. One, one long yeah. queue of awesome, yeah. yeah. So, uh, you know, keep, keep <laughs> watching the videos and, uh, like and subscribe. Yeah, indeed, yes. Like and subscribe. Hey, you're not a proper YouTuber unless you say like and subscribe. <laughs> Happy New Year, and uh, we'll see you soon. Happy New Year.